Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back from break. I am Dr. Haynes with you today, bringing you a lecture on the origins of World War I. Dr. Ross, myself, and Mr. Buckaloo have argued over the course of several class meetings, the last several class meetings, that Europe's Industrial Revolution really helped fuel its imperialistic domination of Asia and Africa. And the ideas, the ideas of liberalism and free market capitalism help Europeans to justify forcing themselves on the rest of the world. But the early 20th century, events of the early 20th century, presented a severe challenge to the European-dominated liberal world order. Perhaps the most severe challenge was World War I. World War I left 17 million people dead, 10 million military, 7 million civilian. 17 million people dead. Another 20 million people were wounded. That casualty toll made World War I one of the most, or makes World War I one of the most violent, devastating conflicts in human history. World War I left Europe physically devastated as well as leading to a complete political realignment. By 1918, by the end of the war, 1918, four of the world's most powerful empires had either been destroyed or changed beyond all recognition. First, Russia's Romanov dynasty collapsed in the face of the Bolshevik Communist Revolution in 1917. Second, Germany's hereditary ruler was forced to abdicate. Third, the Habsburg Empire of Austria-Hungary disappeared completely. And fourth, the Ottoman Empire also collapsed. Plus, World War I created the circumstances that allowed fascism to emerge. First in Italy in the 1920s, and then in Germany in the 1930s. And finally, within the space of just 20 years, the First World War led to the Second an even more horrific conflict than the first. So, in other words, the First World War, the Great War, so-called, the First World War was a major turning point in world history. Consider the irony here. World War I was this catastrophically, catastrophically violent upheaval that brought physical and political devastation. It all emerged at the very center of European civilization. Think about the last several lectures. Smug Europeans had been crowing for ages about their inherent superiority. They had been denigrating everyone else in the world as primitive. Or as Rudyard Kipling put it in the poem that you read, The White Man's Burden, uh, white people, white Europeans had a duty, a responsibility to lift up the savage peoples of the world to the level of European civilization. Or Europeans generally, or genuinely, I should say, Europeans genuinely saw themselves and their liberal world order as the peak 
of human civilization. But those Europeans who survived World War I were shaken. They were less convinced of their superiority. Indeed, some began to scorn liberalism as a, a silly fantasy. The very notion that the power of individual human reason and free market capitalism could solve any problem, create perpetual progress, and ultimately perfect human society, that whole idea seemed like a joke in the aftermath of the carnage of World War I. Liberalism had promised a perfect human society, and yet it produced the heart of World War. So, in the aftermath of World War I, many people began to search for an alternative way of organizing global society that would prevent that kind of horror in the future. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here. For today, for today, we are going to focus only on the causes of World War I. Then, after your exam, we'll take a look at the conduct of the war itself, what military historians call operational military history. And then we'll do another class where we sort of try to get our arms around the consequences of World War I. But for today, we're focusing on causes. So, our major questions for today are all about the causes of World War I. First, what were the long-term and short-term causes of World War I? And second, in particular, how did nationalism, the problems of industrial society, the new imperialism, and alliance systems promote rather than avoid war. How did nationalism, the problems of industrial society, the new imperialism, and alliance systems promote rather than avoid war? So, we're going to walk through these sort of big picture ideas, and then we're going to talk about some of the nitty-gritty detailed short-term causes. So first, the long-term stuff, the big picture stuff. Let's switch to a, a big map to give us a sense of you know, what the colonial new imperial world looks like on the, on the eve of war. The long-term causes of World War I really begin with nationalism. The great nation-states of Europe had relentlessly pursued their own economic and political aggrandizement in free and open competition. So rivalries between European nation-states had only grown throughout the 1800s. Europeans use their new industrial technologies to carve up Asia and Africa and exploit them economically in what's become known as the new imperialism, the phenomenon that Dr. Ross and Mr. Buckaloo described in previous classes. So, in this, this uh, system of uh, nationalist rivalries, you know, the new imperialism, each of the great powers of Europe has, you know, related but specific interests. So, Great Britain wants to protect its naval supremacy, as well as its colonies in Asia and Africa. So, on this map, uh, on this map, Britain's holdings are kind of this, like, orangey bit, right? 
India, Australia, South Africa, and, and other places. So Great Britain wants to protect its naval supremacy as well as its colonies in Asia and Africa. France, France wants revenge against Germany for defeats in the Franco-Prussian War in the 1870s. But France also wants to protect its African and Asian colonies. So on this map, you know, the French bits are the blue bits. So a huge chunk of Western Saharan Africa, uh, French Indochina, and uh, some of the islands in the South Pacific. Germany. Germany wants to isolate France diplomatically so that it can't take revenge. But Germany also wants to compete with Great Britain on the oceans and to secure its colonies in Africa and the South Pacific. So on this map, the German bits are green. So they've got a few colonies in South Africa and even fewer in uh, the South Pacific. So Germany wants to protect what they have and get more colonies. Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary. Let's switch maps here. Austria-Hungary, so basically this chunk of Europe. Austria-Hungary wants to extend its control of the Balkan Peninsula, also sometimes known simply as the Balkans. So the Balkan Peninsula is basically this chunk right here in uh, Southeast Europe. So Austria-Hungary wants to extend its control of the Balkan Peninsula by undermining Slavic nationalism. The Balkan Peninsula is home to lots of different Slavic ethnic groups. Serbia, right here, was an independent Slavic nation in the Balkan Peninsula. Serbia wanted to extend its borders to encompass other areas where Slavic Serbs lived, including places claimed by Austria-Hungary. And so right at the outset, there's this tension between Slavic nationalists in Serbia and other places in the Balkans, and Austria-Hungary, this, uh, this multi-ethnic empire that claims to rule them. So, nationalism and the new imperialism are major causes of global instability. Alliance systems. Alliance systems are another related long-term cause of World War I. So let's spend a few minutes talking about the emerging alliance systems. European countries were spending more and more wealth on these big, modern, industrialized armies and navies to advance their nationalist and imperialist agendas. That militarization only worsens the rivalries. So, the great powers of Europe began to create a system of alliances to help protect their interests. Essentially, by 1914, most of Europe was locked into one of these two great blocks. The Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy, or the Triple Entente of France, Britain, and Russia. So by 1914, most of Europe is locked into one of these two big blocks. The Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy, versus the Triple Entente, Great Britain, France, and Russia. As a result, any little short-term local conflict could trigger involvement by all of Europe. So ultimately, the alliance system helps to promote rather than avoid conflict. So 
Where did these big alliances come from? Between 1879 and 1882, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck Between 1879 and 1882, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck led Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy into this triple alliance. It's a defensive alliance where each country promises to assist the others in the event of an unprovoked attack. Germany's Chancellor Bismarck engineered this uh, mutual defensive triple alliance to maintain Germany's power by doing two things. First, isolate France diplomatically. And second, prevent Austria-Hungary and Russia from fighting each other in the Balkans. Now, in 1887, Bismarck also brokered what's called the, the Reinsurance Treaty. In 1887, Bismarck brokered this reinsurance treaty between Germany and Russia. It basically gives Germany a little extra leverage to prevent conflicts in the Balkans between Russia and Austria-Hungary. According to the treaty, Germany will oppose anybody that starts a fight there. Now, Historians remember Chancellor Bismarck as this highly skilled, ruthless diplomat. His leadership really uh, led to the Triple Alliance and the Reinsurance Treaty with Russia. And without his leadership, it couldn't hold. And indeed, it did not. Between 1890 in 1907, a diplomatic revolution occurred in Europe. And that diplomatic revolution led ultimately to the creation of the new Triple Entente to oppose the Triple Alliance. And I'm going to argue that this diplomatic revolution was in part an outgrowth of incompetent leadership. Enter Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. In 1890, the German throne passed to Kaiser Wilhelm II, an erratic, incompetent leader who undid Chancellor Bismarck's careful diplomacy. As one of his first official acts, Wilhelm fired Bismarck and took a leading role in German foreign affairs, but Wilhelm had no training or experience in diplomacy. He was consistently tone-deaf to how other states perceived his decisions. He began in 1890 by declining to renew the reinsurance treaty with Russia. In 1890, Wilhelm II declines to renew the reinsurance treaty with Russia. Remember, the whole point of that thing is to avoid war in the Balkans. From the Russian perspective, Wilhelm's refusal to renew the treaty was a hostile act. But Wilhelm was consistently tone deaf to the way that other nations, other states, perceive his decisions. Russia saw it as a hostile act, they felt threatened, so they looked for a new ally. And Russia allies with France. 
Now, instead of admitting his mistake and learning from it, Wilhelm II blamed the intrigues of imagined enemies. And in 1898, Wilhelm strikes again. He made a bad decision because he failed to consider how other countries perceived his choices. In 1898, Wilhelm authorized a dramatic expansion of Germany's navy. He wants a navy big enough to rival Great Britain on the seas and to guard German access to its colonies in Africa and the Pacific Islands. Well, anybody want to guess how Great Britain responds to that naval buildup? They see it as a hostile act. They see it as a threat. So Britain launches its own massive naval buildup. Essentially, Wilhelm II has provoked an entirely unnecessary arms race. So, Kaiser Wilhelm II destabilized Europe through poor leadership, yet all the while he was convinced of his own diplomatic skill. This is perhaps a good lesson for us at this particular moment in world history. The current U.S. president has no skill, training, or experience in global diplomacy. He rejects the advice of people who do have that knowledge, skill, and experience. Indeed, within months of his election, 60% of the career diplomats in the U.S. Department of State resigned. According to the Washington Post this morning, one of America's most respected newspapers, 58 key diplomatic positions in the U.S. Department of State remain unfilled including, perhaps weighing on the minds of many Americans right now, we have no ambassador to South Korea. And of course, last week, March 13th, the President fired the Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson. All of that contributes to global instability. All of that makes America's enemies as well as its allies confused, vulnerable, defensive. In any case, in any case, Kaiser Wilhelm II uh, was busy destabilizing Europe through poor leadership. Britain, on the other hand, Britain spent the years between 1890 and 1907, this period of a diplomatic revolution, Britain spent these years building new alliances. Britain and Japan both feared German and Russian expansion in Asia and the Pacific Islands. So, in 1902, Britain and Japan entered a naval alliance. Two years later, in 1904, Great Britain allied with France, a state that had been its mortal enemy for centuries. Britain and France allied in 1904 in order to protect their African colonies and to consult one another should any nation threaten peace in Europe. Anybody want to guess how Germany responds? This kind of alliance building irritated Kaiser Wilhelm II. He began to fear, he began to fear that he was encircled by a British-French alliance on one side and a Russian-French alliance on the other, even though his own ineptitude had done much to create those very alliances. So Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm II began to feel more defensive, more aggressive, more hostile, more belligerent. 
as Germany got more hostile, the British-French-Russian alliance only deepened. In 1907, in 1907, Great Britain, France, and Russia concluded a new multilateral alliance, sort of completing the creation of this triple entente, or at least leading to a sort of a more mature phase of its development. Now, this new, stronger, multilateral alliance between Britain, France, and Russia would have been impossible only a few years earlier. And it came about in part because of Wilhelm II of Germany's poor leadership. But it also came about in part because of the problems of industrial society in Russia. So I'm going to talk about that for a moment. The problems of industrial society in Russia. Compared with other European states, Russia had been slow to industrialize. But between 1892 and 1903, Russia tried to catch up embarked on this period of really rapid industrialization. How? It borrowed a lot of money from its new ally, France. Using borrowed French money, Russia capitalized monumental industrialization projects. Perhaps most importantly, the Trans-Siberian Railway. This massive railway system that ran all the way across the Russian Empire. It connected Russia to Siberian oil reserves and to Asian markets. As a result, Russia's industrial output skyrocketed, and so did state revenues. However, however, this kind of rapid industrialization in Russia created the same kinds of problems that industrialization created elsewhere in Europe. Thousands of Russian peasants moved to new industrializing cities. They crowd into urban slums, tenement buildings. They worked long hours in dirty, dangerous jobs for low wages. Meanwhile, back in the Russian countryside, a series of poor harvests led to rising food prices and growing discontent. So, Russian factory workers Russian factory workers began to organize. They began to organize to combat these problems of industrial society. Many of those workers embraced socialism. The ideas of Marx and Engels, which you've read about and which you've written about, the ideas of Marx and Engels seem to explain the problems of industrial society and offer a real solution. So in the early 1900s, Russia experienced constant unrest, student demonstrations, massive countrywide industrial workers' strikes, peasant uprisings, and a series of political assassinations. A constant unrest. The problems, in short, the problems, the problems of industrial society were tearing Russia apart at the seams. Now, by 1907, by 1907, 
The Russian monarchy under Tsar Nicholas II, by 1907, the Russian monarchy under Tsar Nicholas II had largely suppressed this kind of dissent in Russia. But Tsar Nicholas realized that Russia was vulnerable. And that helped Russia and Great Britain get over some long-standing tension and enter into this new Triple Entente alliance with France. So the problems of industrial society contribute to the creation of this system of alliances that ultimately contributes to the Great War itself. Also, just as an aside, those Russian protesters, those Russian dissenters had learned how to organize. Many had embraced socialist philosophy, socialist thought. They would use that knowledge in conflicts to come. So we'll see Russian socialists again real soon after the exam. Now, big picture, back to the big picture. By 1907, by 1907, the diplomatic revolution that began in 1990 was largely complete. Under the poor leadership of Kaiser Wilhelm II, Germany had largely isolated itself and the other two members of the Triple Alliance, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Meanwhile, Great Britain, France, and Russia had strengthened their Triple Entente. The new balance of power in Europe, created by these two great blocs, was so fragile that any small, short-term conflict, any small, short-term, local conflict threatened to careen into a larger conflict. So, for example, for example, We'll look at a couple of these short-term conflicts that should have stayed local, but didn't because of these gigantic alliance systems. First short-term conflict that should have stayed local, in 1908, in 1908, a new Bosnian crisis in the Balkan Peninsula emerges, further destabilizing Europe. In 1908, Austria-Hungary annexes Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herzegovina, I'll spell those, or at least attempt to. Bosnia and Herzegovina. In 1908, Austria-Hungary annexes Bosnia and Herzegovina, these two areas in the Balkan Peninsula, technically owned by the Ottoman Empire. Austria was trying to put down calls from Slavic nationalists in this area for an independent state of their own. Their neighbor, independent Serbia, their neighbor, independent Serbia, was actually encouraging Bosnian Serbs, who were also ethnically Slavic, to call for independent nationhood. So, Austria-Hungary's annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina angers these uh, Slavic Bosnian Serb nationalists as well as Slavic Serbs themselves. Plus, Russia had pledged itself to be sort of the protector and defender of Slavic peoples everywhere. So, Russia has this kind of this duty, this responsibility to help those Slavic Bosnians uh, get a, an independent nation of their own. So Austria-Hungary's annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina opens conflict between Austria-Hungary and Russia, as well as between Austria-Hungary and all these Slavic peoples in the Balkans. Now, 
Germany, remember, they've uh, Germany's opted out of this reinsurance treaty with Russia. And Germany sort of openly supports Austria-Hungary's annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Russia's outraged, and using their new industrial wealth, they embark on their own gigantic, multi-year military buildup. Germany provokes another local short-term crisis in 1911. This time, over African colonies. Germany demanded French cessions of some of its African colonies in exchange for recognition of French control of Morocco, this big colony on uh, the northwest coast of Africa. The rhetoric starts getting heated. France's ally, Britain, chimes in tells Germany to back off, war starts to seem like a genuine possibility. But France ultimately backs down. It gives Germany what it wants in exchange for Germany's uh, sort of uh, accession to France's rule in Morocco. Now, the Moroccan crisis the Moroccan crisis in 1911 yields another stronger military agreement between Britain and France. Each country pledges its navy to protect the other country's colonies. Not just helping each other out, defending each other in Europe anymore. Now they're pledged to militarily defend each other's colonies everywhere in the world. So again, Germany's belligerence is serving only to deepen alliances between its enemies. So, by 1912, by 1912 then, Europe is divided into these two armed camps. Every time a, you know, a small little local conflict breaks out, it threatens to drag the Allies into a bigger conflict. Theoretically, this alliance system is supposed to thwart war, to help avoid war. But it actually seems to be emboldening states to provoke their enemies. Because they know they have allies to back them up. This series of crises fueled by long-term causes such as the problems of industrial society, nationalism, the new imperialism, all contributes to growing instability. All we need is a few more sparks to really set the world on fire. And another spark comes in Africa, and then another again in the Balkans. In 1911, in 1912, Italy invades Tripoli. In 1911, Italy invades Tripoli, this North African area. Technically, Tripoli belongs to the Ottoman Empire, but Italy wants to expand its own colonial empire. Italy quickly defeated the Ottomans, taking Tripoli. The states of the Balkans are watching. They see how easily Italy defeats the Ottoman Empire. And in 1912, in 1912, four small states in the Balkans unite together in a war against the Ottoman Empire. They desire to create uh, you know, an independent pan-Slavic state. They quickly drive the Ottomans out of Europe, but just as quickly, just as quickly in 1913, 
they fight them against each other. You know, they fall to fighting among themselves over the spoils of victory. So these Balkan Wars in 1912 and 1913 set the background for an act of terrorism that had many and long-reaching consequences. In June of 1914, June of 1914, the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and his wife arrived in Bosnia for an official state visit. By the end of the day, both the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife lay dead from an assassin's bullets. The killer, the assassin, was a Slavic Serbian nationalist. You know, one of these um, Slavic Serbians who wants a, you know, an independent, free Slavic homeland for all people in the Balkans. Remember, Russia has pledged to help defend Slavs everywhere. Serbia has an alliance with Russia. And all of that antagonizes Austria-Hungary. Now, remember, this is Europe. Most states are still governed by monarchs, so the assassination of any crown prince is pretty serious business. Everyone, even Russia, Serbia's ally, expects that Austria-Hungary will punish Serbia swiftly and severely. But Austria-Hungary did not respond right away. They're unsure of how Russia will react. Russia's allied to Serbia. What if we invade Serbia and Russia fights back? So instead of responding right away, Austria-Hungary appeals to Germany for help, for support. And Kaiser Wilhelm II strikes again. Kaiser Wilhelm II assured Austria-Hungary that he would back any move they made. This is remembered as uh, Wilhelm II's so-called blank check to Austria-Hungary. He's written on this blank check. He'll back them up on any move that they make. And this is the blank check that allows Austria-Hungary to drag Germany and the rest of Europe into World War I. So assure Germany's support, finally at the end of July 1914, Austria issues this humiliating set of demands to Serbia, knowing Serbia will not accept them. Serbia actually takes a a diplomatic tone. They agree to some of Austria-Hungary's demands. They try to negotiate uh, a little bit. But Serbia fell far short of total submission, total acceptance. So, at the end of July 1914, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Well, that puts pressure on Russia. Serbia's out. What's Russia going to do? Russia announces, Russia announces a partial mobilization of its military. Russia's ally, France, resolves to stand by Russia. Then Great Britain warns Germany that it will stand by its allies, France and Russia. Germany's afraid of having to fight a two-front war. Right? For years, they feared the possibility of fighting France and Great Britain to the west, plus Russia to the east. They're afraid of a two-front war. 
So Germany actually tries to restrain Austria-Hungary, but it's too late. In order to move their massive industrial armies, the states of Europe depend on railways. So if they're going to mobilize, they're held to strict railway timetables. German military leaders calculated that it would take Russia six weeks to put troops in position using their sort of underdeveloped railroad system. So to avoid a two-front war, German leaders calculate they have six weeks to defeat France so they can turn the full might of their military against Russia. So Germany has no time to lose. On August the 1st, 1914, the German army invades Belgium on its way to Paris. And they've got six weeks. But since Germany just violated Belgian neutrality, the British join. France mobilized to meet the invading German forces. Pretty soon, the continent is engulfed in the conflagration of war. Incredibly, at least in retrospect, incredibly, all of Europe went to war in 1914 with great enthusiasm. Happy crowds lined the streets of Berlin, Vienna, Paris, and London as soldiers go marching off. Everyone thinks they're going to win. Everyone thinks it's all going to be over by Christmas. Germans believe in two weeks, the threat of it, I'm sorry, six weeks. Germans believe that within six weeks, the threat of a two-front war will be passed. Great Britain sees this whole thing as an opportunity to put an end to the German naval threat. France is happy to avenge its uh, losses in, from its uh, defeat in the 1870s at the hands of Germany. Everyone believes that they're going to use this conflict to protect the colonial possessions they have, plus take a few more from the other guy. Everybody is pretty excited about this conflict. They see it as an opportunity, not a threat. In the end, nationalist divisions Nationalist divisions have become the most important dividing lines by 1914. Not allegiance to any particular ideology, like liberalism or socialism. Not allegiance to any particular religion. Not an allegiance to any particular mode of governance, you know, constitutional, monarchy, republicanism, uh, whatever. It's nationalist divisions that are the true dividing lines. The war is about exercising national power, not just in Europe, but abroad. And the exercise of national power will wreak great suffering in the world. So we'll pick it up there after the exam.